Hello and welcome to the Addicts Anonymous podcast. I'm your host, Jim R. Today, we're going to be speaking with Minister Deb. How are we doing, Minister Deb? <laughs> I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm doing well. Glad to see you. You got a big smile on your face. So uh-huh. let's dive in. Let's talk about your childhood. Oh, my childhood sucked. <laughs> like everybody else is up. Um, I live with my mother. My mother was mentally ill and I live with my father up to I was 10 and my mother came and picked me up from school and my brother and my sister took us, we live from Florida, took us to Texas. Um, soon after the guy that my mom took off with abandoned us and then we ended up being, um, homeless for the next till, you know, most of the time live, I lived on, uh, on the streets homeless. I had to take care of my, my brother that was uh, 10 years younger than me. I was like 11. He was like, uh, he was still an infant, lost 10 an infant when we got here. And I had a sister two years younger. Um, most of the times, you know, my mama ran from man to man, homeless to homeless, uh, dumping me off with other, with friends of hers or wherever, you know, most of the time I was homeless and, you know, hungry, all that stuff. Yeah. And, all that um, at such a I, young age. Yeah. And then when I got 14, I, I met a guy, said he loved me. I think that was my first addiction because I he made me feel different, made me, and, and he just used me. Uh, and then uh, after that, I was just promiscuous. We got back together when I was 16. I ended up pregnant. I mean, before that, I was 15. You know, I started after I, I started getting promiscuous at 14 and a half, at 15. Um, I was walking home. This is, I lived in Texas and um, I was abducted by two men and took in 45 miles away. They put drugs in my, they gave me a beer and they put something in it. And I woke up, uh, I was woke up in Galveston and I was fighting them. And the more I fought them, the more they beat me. And I think the first time I ever heard, felt God with me, I felt him, I heard, I heard something tell me, if you're not a threat, they won't kill you. So being really experienced in sex and anything I just like oh okay we're having a party I listened to that voice you know and I I felt a peace after that and I knew it was God but after that I didn't like God because he let these guys rape me the rest of the night they didn't beat me or anything after that but they still did what they did and after that I didn't have nothing to do with God because I knew he was there but then he didn't help he didn't save me from what they did to me and then uh I think I could this time about nine o'clock at night, I think they brought me home four or five o'clock in the morning. They dumped me out in the street and a police officer picked me up and he said, um, you know, you could, something can happen to you out here. And I wouldn't tell him I was too scared. And I told my mom, when I went to my mom, I said, mom, I was right. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry. You know, and I remember going to the shower, just sitting there crying and feeling, I didn't do drugs at the time. Didn't, you know, I've experienced, uh, you know, uh, all of my friends did drugs. I didn't do drugs. So that pain was so there. I didn't know. I kind of cut myself. Had, I was just saying, you never had a chance to do, um, I, I believe with women, don't you get a rape kit where they ask you to like stand? Like, I wouldn't tell nobody. I was scared because I knew that I knew one of the people and I was scared. They told me if I come back, they would kill my sister because they knew where my sister lived. So I wouldn't tell nobody. I just kept it in. Yeah. And um, then I was still promiscuous. I didn't, I, I experimented with drugs and drinking and I didn't like drinking because one time I woke up in two counties away in the back of van, but I was willing that time. Um, I just didn't want people to take advantage of me. So I wasn't into drinking. I wasn't into drugs as a teenager at all. Um, my friends were, but I wasn't. Um, just that pain of uh, everything that happened to me. And then I'll end up 16 pregnant and homeless again and I moved up here to West Virginia with my dad I had my baby I went back when I was 17 uh, I met a man and um he told me I could live with him and then that ended up being a 17 year hostage situation where I was terribly abused forced to have two abortions on my way to have my third abortion my my son kicked and I refused to have that abortion uh, how old were you when your third abortion I was like, but it was after my other, because I was 17, I was about 18 the first time, 19 the first, 19 or 20. It was in between each pregnancy. I have three living children. So it was in between each 
child and I was supposed to have one with my third child. I was 21 when I had him. So what you're saying is you aborted every other child for a while. Yeah, because my husband forced me. And then the last time, like I got five minutes before the abortion clinic and my son, I remember him picking me and I told my husband, I said, I don't care what you do to me. He wasn't even my husband. We lived together. I called him my husband. Well, he wasn't, we weren't married, but um, I told him I wasn't going to have an abortion. He can do what he wants to. Uh, and I ended up having my child. Um, I ended up leaving him and he paid for my apartment and stuff. It was just like real abusive. But, um so many years <laughs> i mean he used to um he kicked my teeth down my throat with his steel toe boots he he shot me in the chest with a 38 he took all the he took all the bullets out of the gun and uh one night i mean this is when i started doing drugs see i didn't he was a drug addict let me back up he was a drug addict and alcoholic I wasn't. I was trying to take care of my kids and stay home. He was a Mexican. Him and his brother, just like Cheech and Chong, they had parties at the house. That when our house was like parties, like my kids would go around drinking everybody's drinks, and there there'd be marrow, big old garbage bags full of marijuana, um, all kinds of stuff like that. That's what our house looked like with children. It was a big old party house to them. With me and my children moved in. My, with me and my my four month old daughter, he adopted her, and he was good with her. But then I had three more children. And um, we went back and forth to me living away, him paying my rent. Um, it got to the point when my kids were four, six, and eight. Um, the year before, he broke my jaw, so I went to Daytona Beach. That's where I was born. I went to work there. Um, I couldn't take care of the kids. He picked up the kids. I came back, but I couldn't live with him because he was so abusive, so I kind of went out in the streets. All of my friends were drug addicts. I didn't do drugs at the time. I think when uh when you say you went out, what was, what was your reason for going out on the streets? Because he would abuse me and beat me and throw me out of the house. I had no way to, I didn't know how to work. I, he would throw me out with, with just a pair of shorts and a shirt on. So the, the men at the bar accepted me. You see what I'm saying? I went to the streets, to the bars. So I hung around the bars all the time. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but I used to always go off with a man and I didn't know that I was prostituting. <laughs> you know, I'd go with this guy and he would come and pick me up at the bar. These are, these are guys from, these are guys from the, the Mexican cartel. <laughs> they would be at the bars and I was a young, pretty girl. And, uh, this one guy, he was from the Mexican mm -hmm. cartel. He would pick me up and I, I thought it was, I was his girlfriend. And one day I came up to the bar and I was asking where he was at. And then he would tell me he was with this one girl. And I go, well, she's a prostitute. And all the girls were laughing at me. And, you know, from that day on, and this is way before I started doing drugs, I started being a prostitute. But I hung around the men at the bars because if I go home to my husband, he's abusing me. But he would take care of the children. He took good care of the children. But when I come, he would abuse me. So what, what am I going to pick? Am I going to pick going home with my husband that's abusing me or go to the to the um, bars where these men are throwing money at me, throwing attention to me, being nice to me, which is somebody else's husband that's abusing them at home. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, I kept on trying to get back with my husband. Uh, one night, we were back and forth. I'd be at the bars. He didn't even drive me to the bars and drop me off. That's how bad it got. It, it, it went like that for about four four years, back and forth and like that. And um, one night, um, I caught him in the bathroom shooting up and I asked him, I said, here, let me see what you get out of that. And I stuck my arm out and you can see the scar. I got scars all everywhere. Um, he stuck that needle in my arm and I, and that was the first time I felt an escape. He shot me up with cocaine and right then I didn't have to feel anymore. And that's when I got addicted. And then, uh, the men... The men that I hung around with the bars, they sold cocaine. They brought cocaine up from Mexico. I never did do it before. I was just taking their money. I wasn't doing the drugs. Then it started and I'd go to the bars. They would give me lines, lines. And then uh, on my 25th birthday, I think that's when I really crossed the line is um, I took off. I was staying at my staying with him for a while and I just couldn't take it some more. So my 25th birthday, I took off and I said, I went off and I, um, I met this one guy and he was really up. He was like the boss with all the drugs and everything. And these guys brought me over there to hook me up with him. And I 
started smoking that crack and I could not stop. Um, I was gone for three was months. Was he smoking so, crack? Why did you start smoking crack? Was he smoking crack? Yeah, we were at somebody's house and these other guys, he was married. He was smoking. The, the other guy, the drug dealer was smoking crack. He just wanted a pretty girl to sit there with him when they smoked crack. And I was a pretty girl. <laughs> so, and I wasn't the only pretty girl. He would get me to get other pretty girls, but it, we was, they didn't do anything sexual or nothing to us. They just liked having pretty girls, but it was weird. You know, I don't know. You're a man. <laughs> I don't know. They, like, they just liked having pretty girls. But I ended up being that guy's girlfriend, even though he was married and he did set me up an apartment and all that. My 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 husband caught me. He was saying, why don't you go home? He saw hickeys on my neck. And I said, no, I'm, I got another man. I don't want you. And then one night that man went home. So I got bored and went home. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so my husband. told your ex-husband. Are you still your husband? Yeah. He passed away three years ago, but I'm sorry this, to hear that. That, that's another story. I was there when he passed away and I led him to Christ. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, this was, this happened in 1987, 86, 88, when I got, when I got shot. Anyway, when I came home, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> it was came amazing. Home from what? Huh? Came home from what? I, I took off on, on my birthday on September 16th in 1988. I took off and then I met that man and I started smoking that crack for three months. November 30th, I decided he went home to his wife. So I said, I'm going to go home to my husband. When I came home, he had that 38 waiting on me underneath the couch cushion because we had done lost the kids. I wasn't trying to get the kids back. Uh, the welfare didn't come our kids because they found out we were doing drugs. He was doing drugs and I wasn't trying to help him get his kids back. I was just like, okay, I'm getting you getting high. I'm getting high to hell with the kids. That's pretty much, I remember shooting up one time with my, the welfare worker in the, in the living room. This and is I'm your husband that has the gun. Yeah. With the kids. But see, my boyfriend was the one that was smoking the crack. He was a big, he was a big, big, he was a big drug dealer. He had most of Houston. He had several 10 guys had apartments selling dope for him and I thought I arrived and anyway it's funny how when I got shot that man never even thought about me you know what I'm saying but anyway I came home my husband started uh asked me if I had any dope and I didn't have no dope and then he just turned angry he went and pulled the pistol out from underneath the couch cushion um he pistol with me he beat me for a long time I think if I would have brought dope home it would have been a different scenario um he kept on putting the gun up to my head. And I remember him taking all the bullets out. It was a 38. He put the first bullet, you know, he only put one bullet in it, twisted around and he pulled the trigger right here. And then he said, you lucky B, you know, and um, no sooner he said that, he put the gun right here, right here into my chest and he pulled the trigger and the gun went off. And he shot me and it went through my kidney, it went around my rib cage, went around my kidney and my spleen. But after he realized what he was doing, he tried to call 911, try to help me. He tried to tell me to tell the police that I came in the house and I, he didn't know it was me. So I agreed. But as soon as the police came, uh, I was telling him, yeah, he shot me. He shot me. But when they, they took me to the hospital, they're doing exploratory surgery. And um, the um, I guess the police or whatever, they were in there while they were doing surgery on me, asking me questions. They go, well, I know they thought it was a drug deal. They go, we know you, we know you, because the guy was the FBI. I remember seeing FBI guys and everything. And I would shoot the finger at them. You know, they would be in a van and pass us by at the bars and stuff. I knew the FBI was watching me, and um, I just why shot was the finger. FBI watching? Because I was with one of the biggest drug dealers in Houston. Okay, my boyfriend, the guy that I took off with, was one of the biggest notorious drug dealers in Houston. Gotcha. And he was from the Mexican cartel. So they had been watching him. So they had seen me because I was always with him. You know, for the last past three months, I was with him wherever he went, you know. And uh, anyway, they came back and told my husband, can we search your house? Can we forgot a clipboard. And they came back and they tore our house. They tore the cushions. They, they ripped everything up looking for drugs. Because they thought that I got shot over a drug deal. That I got drug, I got uh, shot over my husband being jealous. But anyway, um, after he shot me, I came back with him. Um, I lived with him too. 
I didn't, I didn't, I stayed with him because I didn't know where else to go. I was being abused by him. I had no job skills. I didn't know how to work. I, the, 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 um, the doctor didn't want me to go home with him. I said, where am I going to go? Those people on the street ain't going to take care of me. You know, I could barely fend for myself when I was out there. So I went back home with him. I actually lived with him. But when he shot me, I was there eight and a half years. I was with him for another eight and a half years. I was with him 17 years whatsoever. Uh, altogether, um, I gave one of my daughters up for adoption. They took the one daughter. I never did get her back. The state of Texas took her and they had her till she was seven, 17, till she was 18. They let her go. My other daughter moved, was in Indiana and I moved, after I gave my daughter up for adoption, I moved to Indiana and I thought I could get away from the drugs. And what happened was I would, I knew people that would send them to me in the mail and I, think, and I didn't know I was an addict. I just knew I could control. I just knew the day that the drugs come in, I lost control of my life for that day. I wouldn't come to work. Uh, maybe the package come in. Oh, you started ordering I, drugs online? I, I was ordered in the mail. And, and the U.S. mail. <laughs> you know, I hope I don't get in trouble for that. But yeah, but I would get it in the mail by some people. They would send me a package and I would get it. Uh, and after a while, I think somebody got busted and they quit sending. I got it for two or three years and they quit sending it to me because somebody got arrested and I was okay. After they quit sending the drugs, I got, I was 30 years old. I got a job, uh, ended up being a manager in three months at a deli. Then I got another job and then I learned how to work and take care of myself. And, uh, about 33, I took off, I took, I was, I moved to Indiana when I was 30. So when I was 34, I took off with another man. <laughs> uh, and I, I knew he was going to kill me if he caught me. So what I did was went to, I got married to that guy. So he couldn't say nothing. And I had to go to court over my daughter. My daughter was 18. She got out. She was, she was just so violent when she got out because they stuck, they put her morphine. They put her with all kinds of drugs. I think it was, no, it was not morphine. It was Thorazol and Halidol. They kept on that until she was 18 because they didn't want to deal with her. I got her back at 18. Um, when she got back, everything got chaotic. Anyway, um, me and her got into altercation. I had to put her, I had to lock her up to protect her because she was just, she put her um, arm through my window and stuff. And I got a caseworker to help her. And um, that night I left, I told my husband, I said, I'm going to go get some clothes for her and bring them to me. He goes, wait till in the morning. And I, I left and didn't come back. And he had to go to court for my daughter and I did too. So the way I got away from that husband was um, I got married to somebody else. And it was funny. We was at the courthouse and I said, look, I'm married. I showed him my marriage license and um, scared he was going to kill me. But I don't know. It's like he let me go. Um, after that, I got with this other guy. Um, I've been doing real good working. I didn't know I was addicted. I just remember going to Texas and um, I still had ties with that drug cartel. And um, I remember I told my boss, I'm going to bring back an eight ball. He said, why don't you bring me something back? And by the time I got there, what he wanted, what I wanted, that's how much I could buy an ounce for. So I bought an ounce. I took come back. And I started selling it. And my, my second husband did not do drugs. He didn't want me doing drugs. I kind of <clears throat> I kind of manipulated my way because he worked all the time while he was at work. Say so when I would um I would tell him, hey, you want to sell some drugs? And so he would so that I was manipulating him. And yeah, he wanted to sell drugs because he was a Mexican. He worked on the farm. He didn't make very much money. So yeah, he I got him to help me going back and forth to Texas. I was running drugs from Texas. I was probably gonna make it in one one week. Uh, I'm blessed right now because um, I got stopped one time. I think I had four or five ounces of cocaine on me, and the uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, the Texas what do you call it? Texas Rangers stopped us, and I had that dope on me, and they searched me and didn't find it. But they were fixing to take me to jail, and I kept I kept on saying, "If y'all tear up my car, what y'all's badge number?" I was being real slick, and I said, "If y'all don't tell me, give me your badge number, because if you don't put my car back like you said." Um, I'm going to have y'all reported, but they let me go. And I had all that dope on me one time. And, um, uh, I was with that man. It got chaotic. He, he used me. I used him. Uh, 
Pete caught on real quick how to sell dope, how much, because I couldn't sneak any more out because I would like, here, I'll bag it up for you, but I would steal half of it. That mm. way I could support what won't happen. He got, he, he caught on to that. He started buying women with drugs. It was just crazy. I think I was with him a year and a half. I left. I got with another relationship. He was, I was 36, 36 then. And he was 19. Uh, and we did the same thing with him too. It was just crazy. Uh, I got off of drugs for a while with the other box because we had a good relationship. It wasn't like we did it all the time. I said, now let's stop. And we had a good life. Uh, I remember a Mexican coming to our, where we worked at and they were asking me something about drugs. I said, no, I don't sell drugs anymore. I think I was clean. I was taking care of my daughter's son. He was just a little baby and I loved him. I loved him more than anything. He was with me that day. And um, he said, no, it's like the devil followed me where I, where I was at. It followed me. We're out on a 60 acre farm. And this man came out of nowhere and said, hey, you want some Coke? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. And um, I did it. When I come back in, I couldn't even touch my grandson no more I didn't hit the interest with him I don't know it was just it was crazy because he was my whole world and he'd been my whole world for the I guess he was six or seven months old he was my whole the whole world the whole time I kept him all the time after that <clears throat> keep him no more I saved enough drugs for my for him because I know if I gave my boyfriend some drugs he would go get some more because I didn't have any money and that's what happened uh I ended up that that demon just woke up in me and I couldn't take care of the kid no more. I couldn't do nothing. My The whole thing was I need another one. I need a weather. I had a real good relationship with my boyfriend. We were both doing so good. But I started sneaking up behind his back. He worked at night. I would go prostitute to the drug deal. I go straight to the drug dealer and started prostituting. And uh, it was on. And then me and him got into sell. It was just, it was horrible. Like for four or five years, it was just horrible. And I really loved him a lot. And it was a really good relationship. I messed that up. After that relationship broke, I went to rehab, stayed a year and a half clean. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of things did you do to cause the breakup? Cause the what? What kind of things did you do that caused the breakup? The breakup, I was prostituting behind his back with his okay, friends. Okay, so he found out about that. Yeah, and you know, I had a guilty conscience, and I told him to, you know, I'm stupid. <laughs> I did have a guilty conscience, and, and, you know, and I felt bad at what I was doing for him. I actually broke up. I didn't want to break up with him, but I know I was killing. One time I came home, he was trying to hang himself in the in the barrier. You know, come, he was only 19 when I got with him. He was like 21 years old wanting to hang himself. You know what I'm saying? So I yeah. knew I'm older than him. He's the same age as my child. You know, him and my daughter are nine months apart. And I love that man so much. I took him to his brother and said, hey, you're just going to have to take him. And I regret it because I really, 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 really loved him. But to see him, you know, when I first got with him, because he kept on wanting to do the coke, wanting to do the coke. And I was like, no, because I know what this stuff's going to do to us. But it was like after that one, you know, I was with him two or three years and maybe we'd do it once a year. We were OK. We, you know, I'd miss it and it'd be OK. And we'd go on about our life. But that one time when that man came up, it was like the devil brought it up there himself. And when he did it that day, that turned for the worst. And then the rest of our relationship was nothing about dope. And um, his relationship with me after that was me getting dope for him, you know. It wasn't even about he cared about me. He wanted me to get dope because he knew I know how to get it. He knew that I could hustle. You know, see what I'm saying? He didn't know how to hustle. And then he started learning how to hustle. But that man today, he is uh, married again. And he's got, he's got, um, I think a 15 year old daughter, two other kids. But you know what? I was robbing him because he never had kids and I was a cougar. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. So I, I did the best thing I could for him. Even, you know what I'm saying? I did the best thing. I, you yeah, know, even I, mean, though I, I wasn't a bad person. I was just sick. And I loved him that much that I wanted him to have a family and I wanted him to have a good life, you know, and um, but that hurt me so much. I was a year and a half clean. I was uh, end up being a director of a halfway house. I was doing the jail meetings. And one day that little thought come up. Won't you just put one in you? Won't you just do one? You've been doing so good. I was living at my daughter's house. I relapsed. That thing took me out in another nine years. This took me out in the streets. You know, how my, you know, at first. I was a pretty little 20 year old while the guys would give me everything Thir in my thirties. I was a hustler when well, my forties, the, when I was in the, like I said, in my twenties, you know, I did dope, 
in my 30s, like in my 30s, I sold dope. In my 40s, that dope sold me. And, you know, I used to get so mad when, when I was in, you know, after, when me and that guy was break up and after we broke up and stuff for a couple of months, I was selling. I was getting mad because girls were bringing me $10, $15. I said, you got to come with me $50 or you don't come with me with nothing. And I got my payback because I went out in the streets and look, I end up selling myself for, I've always, when I prostitute, I always at least get a hundred dollars. Even when you're 40 something years old, come on, you ain't gonna get no hundred dollars anymore. Especially when you go out in the street, when a bunch of other girls are doing it for 10, $15 and they're like 18, 19 years old. That's the reality of it. So I had to take whatever I could take. And I was out on the streets, nowhere to go. Um, for a couple of years. Well, what are these young what are these young girls doing for such a cheap number? That I don't know. That, they, the, the tricks that we had were whoever they would just go for 10, 15 dollars, you know. Just I always did for at least 20, and them guys want to change back. I told them, you're crazy. <laughs> you know? But if that, that's all I could get, I would do it. You know what I'm saying? Because that drug, I needed that drug that bad. I I I I did that. You know what I'm saying? I would get other girls with me. So we can make more money. And these guys, I said, no, you ain't paying us. You're going to pay us good for this one. We're fantasy. You know, I'm just, yeah. and um, I, I never tried to hurt people, though. I never did. I never tried to steal from people. I tried to just, okay, I know how to make my money. I had my clients. Uh, I knew how to do all that. But other girls knew that I knew how to make money. So they would try to cash in on it, you know, and um. I'd always have one girl with me and the thing of it was they're in my house. They got my tricks. So whatever we get, whether they choose them or choose me, I didn't care who they chose. Um, we're doing the dope together. Kind of much, pretty much like that for nine years. I was in and out of rehab, uh, got into another abusive relationship. It was really, it was, this one was really demonic. And um, uh, I remember turning 50 years old and I remember my, uh, the, I remember them telling me, I mean, I, I heard the devil always tell me you're going to die. Like my sister, I forgot to tell you that right after I got shot, I got shot on November 30th of 1988, December 17th, my sister was on drugs out of her mind. She's been just got out of jail. She was staying at my house. Um, me and her got into a fight and she took off hitchhiking because she kept on telling me she wanted to kill herself, but she took off hitchhiking on Interstate 10 down there in Houston, between Houston and Baytown and she got hit by a car and killed. That was 17 days after I got shot. So how I used to say, how did she get shot? How did I get shot and live? And she gets hit by a car and dies. You know, it was it was really messed up. So anyway, I I was on the streets until my date that I got clean was two. Th I was on uh, February the sixth, two thousand fourteen. That wasn't my first clean date. It was probably about my. 20th because I was relapsed and back and forth in between those nine years that me and my boyfriend broke up um this time I was in a crack house and God came to me everybody thinks I'm crazy but he came to me he kept on trying to tell me come on you gotta go you gotta go and I know if I didn't go at the time I would die um I wanted to leave the day before because my sugar daddy had a whole bunch of dope and I wanted to go I wanted to get party one more time before I got to rehab and um I so is it your free. inner voice is it your inner voice saying it, or do you hear a, a different voice? Well, with God, I hear. I'm I really curious God. about that because I'm what you call agnostic, which means I'm in the middle. I don't know. I'm not against yeah, religion. Know. I'm very interested in religion, actually. I do. I've always heard something, but didn't know what it was. I, have you ever been at a place and you feel something that says "leave now" and you leave right now and you come back and all kinds of stuff happen, like in your gut right here. I always say now it's Holy Spirit that saved me. I don't know. I hear God, but I'm prophetic. I never knew I was prophetic. I didn't know. I just had a sensing and knowing. I have knowing. I, I have a knowing. I don't know how I know, but I know. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm accurate at it too. I, I'm actually in prophetic ministry now where I can learn about my gifts because my mother was the opposite. She was into witchcraft. You know, and the devil will use the same gifts as God will, you know, but the devil, when he gets finished with you, he'll discard you. But I don't know how I knew. I didn't even. When I was five, I dreamed that a man shot me in my living room and, and it happened exactly the same way it happened. 
Hmm. The day that my the day that my sister got killed, I remember I kept on having a knowing or feeling a week before, but I thought I was being paranoid because I was on drugs because she was had to hitchhike. I thought, oh my gosh, she's fixing to get killed. She's killed. and it was so bad. It was such a bad feeling. I thought it was because I was high. I was just tripping. And about a, she came home. And I was okay at ease. And then let me see. Uh, then the day that she died, I was dreaming about following a cream color hearse and she I was walking behind it and she woke me up from that dream actually uh seven months ago one of my sponsors was murdered by her husband she had texted me and talked to me about her husband abusing her and he was like real demonic and stuff and um I went to sleep and I dreamed that he was coming in the back door with firearms and I asked her I said does he have firearms she said yeah and I said, well, I can't come get you because if we go up there, it's going to be a bloodbath. And 11 days later, he shot her and killed her right there. Her kids were still, her kids were in the house. She had twins that are two, a four month old, him and another guy still, you can look it up on the internet. He uh, stayed in the house three days while that lady was in dead, drug her downstairs. She was only 30 years old. So I kind of relived my horrific with my husband with that too. It, she, it killed her. So sad. Uh, yeah, and I don't know, I, I pick up stuff like that. Now that I do that, I told you I am a minister. I'm a licensed minister now. I am in a prophetic ministry. I just I don't know how I know. It's just the gift of God. I knew he told me to leave. I remember the last night that I used, I kept on something kept, kept on telling me, go, go, go. But I was trying to hang on to that abusive voice. So at what to, age, what, what was, what and when was the first time you used? What did you use and when did you use it? Oh, when I first used, I probably about 14. I probably just drank some MD 2020 or something, but I didn't. What's MD 2020? It's a nasty wine. (laughs) Nasty wine. Yeah, we we got we got with some guys and they were going to take us to Galveston. We started puking in the car. They took us home. But um, (laughs) I didn't really drink. I mean, I, I tried the marijuana. I didn't like the marijuana. I remember that time when I was 15, I uh, did some acid. I didn't like it because it freaked me out. I wasn't a drinker. I mean, I, w- I liked the lifestyle though. I liked when I was 16 years old, I went to the bars I would because you had to be 18 to be in the bars. But back in Texas, you know, I used to go to the bars all the time when I was 16 years old. Yeah, I kind of like, I think I got more, it was the lifestyle, not the drugs. Because even though I was with the drug dealers, I didn't touch the drugs for at least four years after I was hanging around with them. They was, you go to the motel, they have big old lines, you know, and I would never touch them. I didn't want them. My, um, when I started using drugs, it was because of, of my drugs use came from trauma, trauma from all that stuff being abused, you know, as a child being neglected, being, um, just dumped, you know, in the world. And, uh, then my husband abusing me and my thing, what I did was self-medicate. This time when I got into recovery, my thing was I would always um, be promiscuous. I want a man to love me, so I would sleep with every man, and they just used me. So the prostitute, that's why I'm becoming a prostitute at 21 years old, because they ain't going to use me. If they want me, they're going to have to pay for me. And my mindset was like that until I got clean at 50 years old. I've been celibate now since 2015. I don't have a relationship. Um, like I said, I'm waiting on God because I want a I want a godly relationship. I don't want all that stuff that I had before because that was where my two addictions were: men, toxic men. Let me add that: narcissistic men, men that are controlled. Uh, I teach about that. I, I I do work at a rehab and I do teach about narcissism. I teach about boundaries. I didn't have any boundaries because I wanted somebody to love me and I just accepted whatever they gave me. Today, I'm not accepting none of it. So if I'm like 60 years old, 70 years old by myself, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Because um, my, it was like a um, circle. When I did my 12 steps, I did my self abstinence from the drugs and the men. I slipped up with the men about two years and it was just the same old stuff. I said, this is the same old stuff and I'm not going through this again. So I just yeah. quit. I, said, I don't want none of it. So I had to learn how to have healthy relationships, healthy people. I do have healthy people in my life. Most of, you know, for me being, I was out on the streets and that was the one that everybody laughed at. Everybody said, look at her in the same clothes for days with no shower. I mean, I would sneak into places to take showers and stuff. It was this old rooming house. I'd take showers, just filthy, nasty, stinking. 
person that all I did was drugs and I was slept in abandoned houses and this was eight years ago. Now today, all of my friends are pastors, apostles, and people go, how, what are you hanging around with them? I have good friends. They take me on vacations. I mean, they give me their credit. I remember one pastor said, hey, are you and your friend go off? <laughs> y'all go to get y'all something to eat. I said, you're giving me your credit card <laughs> for real? And you know what? I did this and um, I went on a mission trip last, last um, it was in June. I went on a mission trip to Nicaragua and uh, uh, people were giving me donations to go to Nicaragua and I had all but a thousand dollars paid and somebody handed me a check for two thousand dollars and I'm like I didn't even think twice about it I took the money that I needed and poured a thousand to feed the children didn't even think about it didn't even did what well, I, well, I, I missed the last part you did I what said, was the thousand dollars one or no, they gave one, me a, but we're giving they get, I was going on a mission trip and people were giving me money to go on a mission trip. And this lady said, God said, I'm giving you this. And I only needed a thousand and she gave me 2000. So I kept the thousand for my, for my, my expenses and everything. And I immediately right then forward the other thousand dollars to go to the children, to feed the children in Nicaragua. That's great. That's really good. I mean, That's I a lot of money down money. there, right? Yeah. And I didn't even think twice about it. I got credit cards to pay. I got a new car. I got, but I mean, that old um, drug addict, um, whatever it was, you know, because if like it wasn't, if it wasn't the drugs, I was selling it and I wanted the money, but it wasn't about that anymore. It's about helping others. You know, yeah. now I help others. I help others. I pick up girls and take them places and they go, I take them out to eat. I buy them books. I teach them. And they go, why are you being nice to me like that? So somebody was nice to me. I know what it's like to have nobody. I think if I was younger and I had a woman that was healthy, like a mentor, like I'm a mentor now, I tell the girls, I said, I'm not talking to you when I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me when I was your age, when I lost much. I work in, I work in a women's recovery house now right, with little children. They're getting their children back. And I said, I'm talk I said, I wasted my life with my children. And I just want you to do better. You know, everything that was, that the devil meant for my, when I belong, I don't know if you don't believe in the devil, because if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the devil, but there is, if there's a, if there's a, I've seen them, <laughs> but if there's a heaven, there's a hell, and I lived in hell, but anyway, um, the enemy just tried, he tries to kill, steal, and destroy, and he wants us to keep us like that, when I was high, I see all kinds of demonic stuff, I've seen them, I've seen them, not everybody sees them, but I've seen them, just like I see God stuff, I see the demonic stuff, I yeah. see warnings, I had warnings, I felt warnings. All this stuff when I thought I was tripping, I wasn't tripping. That was God showing me fix something was fixing to happen. Because I remember being around some people, I couldn't even get high because I know they was about to do something. And I remember one time going, uh, I just went, I made enough money for what I needed a night. And this one guy kept on telling me, come on, let's go here. And I had a big old van and we could have done it in the van to trick. And he took me down this dark road path and he out in the middle of nowhere. And I don't know what it was, but my gut was just screaming, don't do it, don't do it. And I heard the voice, I always heard a voice. He said, I don't know, it's like a small, small voice. It said, don't stop. When you get right there, turn around and leave. And so I seen him and I was like waving. I got to that corner, I turned around. And I was in a big old van and I just floored it. And I don't know what it was, but I know something was fixed to get me. And I was just, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Even though I was still smoking crack. Even though I was still getting high, I was still a prostitute, and I was thanking God for it, because whatever it was, it was fixing to get me. I don't know what it was, but you never had a feeling like that, like something's got bad, bad things to happen. I have yeah. a real, yeah, that's God warning us. That is God warning us. You know, he saved me more than a hundred times. I, I didn't even know that at the time. I didn't know what that was. I know now because I rely, I rely day to day on my gut. You know, I know when stuff's not right, you know, it's kind of, and I was agnostic for a little while, I, I, but no, I wasn't really agnostic. I knew there was a God because that time when I got raped, I heard him. I felt the peace. I knew there was a God, but as a child, I saw all these other families being blessed, everybody else doing good, but he never did anything for me. And I didn't like him. I didn't want him. And then that one day he took me out of that crack house. I just got finished tricking and I was going on the way to get another piece of dope. The last night, the night before, 
I went down, I couldn't get to my sugar daddy's house. So I said, I just guess I'll just die here. I was in the house. I hadn't paid rent for three months. I had no other oh, piece to turn my electricity off. Um, I went in a, in a, it was an ice storm. I went down the street. There was down power lines. I went over the down power lines. I went and got my dope. I came back and I put the whole thing on there. And I told God to either kill me or help me. And I put it all on there. I didn't die. I woke up the next day. There was a knock at the door. There was a trick. I went out to go get my dope. The guy said, wait a minute. When I came back, a man that used to take me to church who was out there. And he said, you ready to go get help? And I said, wait, I got $20. I'm going to go get me some dope first. And he said, I ain't got time. If you want to stay here, do it. But then I knew it was God telling me, either you go get help or you're going to die. And I was, you see my pictures, I was almost half dead. Anyway, I just gave him that $20. I said, here, this is gas money. The guy will give you another 10 when I get there. Uh, I went upstairs and I just got dropped down on my knees and I said, God, help me, help me. I can't do this. Help me. And I remember hearing him say, get up and be the woman of God I called you to be. And I was waiting for him to just like, oh, poor you and give me a big hug. It wasn't like that. He said, I'm going to get up. From... And I said, what? <laughs> anyway, I got, I took my crack pipes. I had two crack pipes. I took them. I took my lighter. I took two tubs of clothes. I left everything that I owned in that house and um, got in that truck and went. And by the time I got to my friend's house, he said, well, we done we party last night. There's no more money. And I said, well, I wanted to get high before I left. And he said, he gave me 20, he gave me $20. And he said, go ahead. If you want to get high, get high. And I, but I knew the dope wasn't working anymore. I knew what God, he, he gave me a choice, either go across there and get some more dope and die or get in that truck and live. And I chose to live. And I want to tell you it was easy, but it wasn't. I didn't want to go to rehab. I ended up going to my daughter's house. Me and her don't get along. Uh, I was there were three months. She went to prison for two years. I took care of her 12 year old autistic daughter. That was uh, that was the same one that she, she ended up going into that child behavior research. So I didn't take care of her. I had a chance to take care of my granddaughter. So I chose taking care of my granddaughter and I took care of her. Um, I got clean February the 6th, 2014. Uh, I took care of her for two years. I went through a home ownership program. Wiped out $100,000 worth of debt that I was in. Worked that debt through. I uh, lived in a house for 14 months. I found my father. I hadn't seen since I was 16 years old. And I was 50, 50 years old at the time. No, I was 52 years old at the time. Uh, he told me to come home. I came home. I gave my house back and moved here to West Virginia. And um, I don't know. I just just followed God. Just followed God. And um, ended up. I'm a licensed minister now for like almost two years. Um, I'm getting my, this, I have my 501c3. I do faith-based recovery, which I mean, and whether or not we have a lot of agnostic guys where I work at, I just love on them because sometimes, you know, God is love. God is love. That's all it is. And somebody, and you know, the best thing I don't have to preach to nobody. All I got to do is love on them. Just yeah. love somebody. Say, hey, if I can do it. You can do it. It's not about preaching. It's not about throwing a Bible down their throat. It's about loving other people where they're at. Yeah. And I have a lot of oh, one of my um uh, one of my guys. He his his uh his higher power SpongeBob. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's okay. And it's okay. It's okay. That's who it is. You know, you just have to leave people where they're at. I didn't believe. You know, God had to come at me real and show me real. You know, I, I I own I own this house and property. I don't have to pay nothing for it. I have a brand new car. I never had a car in my life. I, I didn't. I got a brand new car off the showroom floor. That one a God because you know JD Ryrider wouldn't even give me a car. Yeah. You know that, that God God has really showed Himself real in my life. Real. That's great. I mean, and I didn't have that before, and I I didn't have that before. But I don't know. He kept on pulling me to these women's, and I'm telling you, my best friends are apostles, pastors, all of this, and I fit in with them. I don't fit in, you know. But I, I work in a recovery house, and I fit in with them too. I just, I get up on the couch with them. We cook food. I live there with them when I'm working. I work there 12 hours a day, and I'm up there with them just like I live there with them. I don't try to act like I'm better than them. I'm like, hey, if I can do it, you can do it. I just, I'm, I'm more of an encourager. Hey, if I could do all that, you can do that. You can do it. You know, if God did this for me, he will do this for you. He's no respectable person. He just wants us to, he just wants us to come to him. And that day I chose God over drugs and my life has never been the same. I mean, it hasn't been the same. I mean, I don't want for nothing. 
peace. That's what the thing of it is, peace, joy, love. You know, I don't have to look for love anymore. I can be love. That's my, that's my boys and girls. I got, I got eight men and eight women, like 10 women. They all love Miss Deb when she comes in there. She did, because I'm, I am love. I love them. You know, and I see them how God sees them. Just like he says, we're not a worthless piece of crap, an addict. We're meeting one night and they go, who are you? And they go, I'm an addict. I'm this. I said, man, I am loved. I am the father. I am the child of the high, high most God. And I said, you know what? And I didn't want to put all the religious stuff on them. So I said, you know what? I'm a, I'm a mother. I'm a sister. I'm a friend. I'm a real friend today. Today, I can be a real friend today. You know, just give them, you ain't got to put it all hard on. You know, I'm a good person today. I'm trustworthy today. And because they just want to, oh, I'm this, I'm this, I'm, I'm never, you, that, you know, it's like you, you hang around the same mindsets to say you can't do something. Guess what? You're never going to be nothing. Yep. You have to get outside of that box. You know, get, I started hanging around a millionaire. And uh, when I was going through that house home owners program, he was on the board. He taught me how to get a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. And I'd like to say I paid all that, but I didn't. I probably paid about 5,000. And, and then that's when God took the rest because he saw me, you know, it's always like, if you do the footwork and you do the best, you said, do you do the best and God will do the rest. And, and that's how it works. I did the best I could. God, for some reason, all this stuff was just taken off. I guess, because it was years after you know i collected all that debt you know i stayed yeah. high for so long but it's all gone you know and start over and then here i am trying to get in debt again i said oh no he got me out one time now i'm responsible and i try to be responsible for my own recovery my own you know i yeah, gotta be absolutely. responsible for me today and um I just love people. I love God. I didn't like them before. I love them. I love them. I love them. I, I mean, every time I go to work, I pray. I say, God, what are we going to do today? How are we going to help somebody today? And he shows me, you know, I hear from him now. I know, I know I, uh, it takes practice. You know, like he said about learning from God. First, you have to get a relationship with him. And then I had to learn. It took took a couple of years because I had to dra- learn different voices like the enemy's voice he'll like yeah 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 you ain't this you ain't that you ain't that that's the devil's voice and then sometimes I hear my voice my selfishness and self-centeredness <laughs> because we can be so I can still be selfish and self-centered oh I want to do this I want to do that uh and then other people they always got their opinions so there's those five voices and I choose to listen to God's voice and that's pretty much what I do that's pretty much what you do, huh? Yes, I'm eight years clean now, but I struggled for it for for nine years. I went in and out of addiction, and I, I probably went out in and out of rec- probably about twenty recovery houses within the or, past uh, nearly a decade. Yeah, the, the 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 nine years before I got clean, I stayed in the women's healing place. I stayed at Wayside Christian Mission. I stayed at several um, halfway houses, but it wasn't until I got God as my higher power because before i didn't have god i could just do whatever i wanted to do it kept on in that self the self will get you back self you know it's either god's will or self-will so i wanted to say it was god's will but it was self-will and self-will kept on getting me running back with them crazy men or kept on running me back to the dope or get me in them situations you know now i listen to god's voice and he'll say uh uh-uh. uh i'll just feel like a little nudge a little nudge no you better not do that you better not do that and I kind of rely on that, you know, and I went through the AA, the 12 steps, and that's where I got my higher power at, through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So you find the steps to be a good program for you? Yeah, the, the AA is first, and then I went on to the um, CR, but yeah, the AA steps, the steps will work for anything, and I wasn't even a drunk, I was a drug addict. And yeah, of course, they work me- for... Huh? Oh, I was just saying they work for anyone. You know, there's certain step programs. Like someone said it about mine that you don't have to even be a drug addict. Because sometimes the same thing with the AA step, it's just about being a better, more honest person. Yeah. Just it, it gives you I mean, why I said God deliver me, but I needed help staying delivered <laughs> because I needed them steps for a guide. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of Christian people I know they go, oh, Jesus, I'm taking away stuff. You know what? I, you know, even though seven months ago my heart was totally destroyed when my little girl got murdered, I didn't want to use 
I was mad at God. Let me add that. I was mad at God. Was your your my, daughter was murdered? My spiritual daughter, one of my sponsees, I told you she was shot. She was shot six months ago by her husband. Right in the middle where I was trying to help her. I was in the middle. Let me add that. I was still trying to help her and she still got killed. How do you want to feel when you're helping somebody and they still get killed? And the enemy wants to put on me, look, you killed her. And the devil is a lie. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Our choice I, I'm shaking my head because I can't imagine that feeling. God bless you for getting through that. Because she, I kept on telling her to go. She kept on, you know, domestic violence. She was telling him where he was going. I had that dream about him with guns. I said, we can't go up there. He's got guns. I can't come get you. You're just going to have to sneak. And she was telling him everything. And then she didn't want to leave because she needed this and this. And she had all, I got to get all the kids stuff. I said, just get you some, get you a bag and go. And she wouldn't do it. And guess what? I was telling somebody in a meeting today, you know, it's her choices that got her killed. It wasn't me trying to help her. It was her choices because I did my best to get her out. And I was telling her she chose to stay there and be petty and fighting with him. And guess what? She was killed right there. And all the stuff, all of her clothes that she didn't want to leave behind was left there. You know, I tell them when we get out of those situations. And she fought, and you know, she was willing to go at first, and all of a sudden she started backtracking on me. And and then the enemy tried to get me to use because of that, you know, I, not to use, but to just try to give up. I said, no, those are her choices. She made those choices not to go. She made her choices to stay there. That's not on my hands. I tried her, but I tried the best I could help her. I tried, I tried to tell her she when she first met that guy in a halfway house to get your recovery first before you get in a relationship. But no, she went around and she got pregnant with twins and he got pregnant again. And she got married and he relapsed. And she relapsed and, you know, I mean, I tried to guide her as best as I could, but she has, I don't try to force people in, in their recovery, their recovery. I can just guide them, be a guide, give my spirit strength and hope. And I can, I see these traps. I see the traps and I warn them, but if they don't take the warnings and they don't take the steps to do what they need to do to get out of a situation, that's not on me, nope. you know? I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to feel guilt, shame, and remorse and go smoke crack because of her decisions. You can only help provide tools and it's up to them if they want to use those tools. Yeah. And that's it. That's all we can do. My kids. I've learned from what I'm doing that Mm -hmm. I can't help everybody. And even if you have to just meet the people where they're at, Mm -hmm. that's all there's to when it comes to that. Yeah, that's 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 where it is. Like my my guys and girls up there, I just love them where they're at and just love on them. You know, they even like I I leave the door open. Uh, do y'all want to go to church with me? Put in a pass, and every week somebody puts a pass in to go to church with me. I don't force nobody to go to church. I don't force my religion on anybody. I don't force anybody. But I say, if you want what I got, you better get some of what I got. <laughs> and I say, I got yeah. Jesus. You know, you know, you want what I got? That's what I got. I got Jesus and I got God. I got, you know, that's what I got. That's that's what I have. And, and maybe that's not for everybody. And I'm okay with it. I'm f- for the ones that come to me and they want help and they want it. Those are the ones and they keep coming back on their own. You know, I mean, I just meet them where they're at. And like I said, most of the time it's just love on them. You know, because they, they have a, programs i try to stay in the aa meetings too i work like today i went up there i wasn't supposed to go today i went up i went up to the therapy class with them and i went to aa meet with them you know because they don't have very, very much aa people here so they don't know so that's what i do my kid's father the one that shot me uh i was gonna add this um three three years ago he passed away but um he passed away 10 months over and he told me he was so proud of me you know and um we found peace at the end i led him to christ on the deathbed on his deathbed and there was such a when he died it was such a peace and i stayed there right with him hold his hand that's you know, good the same, the same man that you know the uh, i think it's the forgiveness forgiveness you know sometimes it ain't about the other person but when i forgave him it's not only set me free I, I don't have ptsd anymore i used to have real bad ptsd i don't have that anymore when i forgave him that ptsd went away and at the end, at the end of his life, I remember I used to want to uh, be on the, uh, you know, the karma. I used to believe in karma. I don't believe in, I believe reaping what you said, I don't believe in karma, but I used to want to be on the front seat and watch it happen. But when I was, 
when I saw him dying there, I just begged God to have mercy on him because I didn't see what happened to him. Whatever, whatever mean and nasty man he was, guess what? It's from childhood trauma. Somebody did something to him when he was a child, a little boy. All I said was a scared little boy that somebody did something to him when he was a child and he could never on this earth live in peace because of it. And he never was, did get resolved, but on his deathbed, he got that resolved with God, whatever it was, because when he, when, he, when he went away, he went in total peace that he could never have on this earth. You know, it was, it was, it was, uh, my kids goes, what, what is this? There's no peace. I said, those are the angels. I believe in the angels and God and stuff. And that's me. And uh, my kids, they don't want to believe in it, but they believe something happened that day because they're going, wow, why, why aren't we crying? Why are we in peace? I said, that's because it's God. And that's because the angels and you know where he went. He went to a good place. And uh, my kids could not, they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe in all that stuff. They go, I don't know what it was, but we were in peace. <laughs> And it's okay where they're, my kids don't believe in that stuff, but it's okay. I said, if you don't believe in miracles, look at your mother. And they told me before on his, when he died that they thought I was going to be dead first because I was the wild one. I'm the one that took off. Uh, they didn't know if I was dead or alive. Every time I saw the news, they didn't know if it was me. They pulling out of the river or behind a dumpster. And I put my kids through hell. They were in their 30s when I got clean. So... Yeah, I put my kids through hell. Uh, my kids today, my son just came here from Cincinnati last week. Him, he adopted two kids, but the mother's an addict. They're uh, four and five now. He adopted them when they were two and three. Uh, he doesn't have any kids of his own. My daughter that just went to prison, um, she's out. She's in ministry school. She's doing real good. She's been in prison twice the last 10 years. And wow. She's she done the whole turnaround. And that's because, because I was consistent in my recovery. You know, if we get consistent in our recovery, people are going to notice. Our family's going to notice. Our kids going to notice. You know, and then we we'll, we lead by example. You know, that's pretty much how it goes. We just lead by example. You know, my daughter used to try to get me to go back. She goes, "You crackhead, all this and all this. Why don't you go smoke some crack?" I said, "Man, you ain't that powerful." Mm -hmm. I mean. You went to jail two years. Where you been? I've been in recovery, and I stuck with it. And and, and it didn't happen in two and four. It happened about in seven years that we just now. And after all the horrible stuff that I I let her endure, oh, she's forty one years old. We had just this year come to peace with each other. We're not down each other's throat. The other night, well, she did. She did. Uh, I had something with my granddaughter because I raised my granddaughter. She's nineteen now. We had an issue with her. And I was getting on to my daughter for not going to check on her because it's in Louisville. And she hung up the phone on me. And I said, well, I'm never going to answer the phone for her. I'm, she's blocked me. Out. She's blocked for life. And, you know, and the next day she said, mom, she texts me. She goes, mom, I'm sorry for you blocking you, but I was overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. And I didn't want to cuss you out. And I said, good girl. And, you know, we just went on from there. We, there was no fighting. No, you know, she listens to me. She, now she don't. Used to, she wouldn't listen to me. She would, everything I'd say, she would bash it. Now she goes, mom, you know, you're right. I want to be like you. She, she's trying to be a recovery coach too, you know? That's great. And she, didn't really, she didn't even do drugs. She has mental issues, mental health issues. So, you know, just being an influence to our children and to others, to, to the people that I, I serve and help, you know, just being a big sister. A big mother, they call me mom. I'm kind of like their mama. Because I'm, now they're all in their forties. I'm almost sixty years old. You're almost sixty, you said. I'll be sixty you, in a year and a half. You look, you look fantastic. You should have seen my pictures when I was younger. I looked way older. God has restored. I'm, I'm fifty-eight and a half. I'm you like, don't look at it all. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was like, where did my, where did that time go? I was just thirty-eight. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm I'm 39, but I know it's kind of the same thing for me. I feel like my mid 20s were just yesterday. Yeah, well, you'll be 58 before you know it. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Get yeah, a little older, get a little wiser, yeah. get a little calmer, also. Yeah, calmer. I'm calmer, but I wasn't calm till I was 50 because I just couldn't sit still. I was talking. We was talking in rehab. We was at the rehab today talking about. Now I'm older. I ain't got time. I ain't got energy to do all that stuff no more. It takes work to get high. Yeah. I ain't got it. it, 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 it and just now I'm used to peace. Peace. 
peace, joy, love, um, doing something for somebody else besides myself, you know, being there for somebody else. And I'm always on, like, if anybody ever needed to talk to me, I'm always there for somebody. That's great. Yeah. That is great. I think this is a good place to end it. I want to thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you. Did you have fun telling your story? Yeah. I I get kind of old telling it because I tell it a lot, but I was like, ah. But um, yes, I do. I just hope, you know, I just want my story to get out to other people that know they can do this. If I can do this, you can do this. You know, we recover from a hopeless mind, a state of mind, body, and spirit. You know, don't listen to those voices that you're not worth it. You got to dig deep down inside of you and say, I can do this. I can do this. And you have to, sometimes I have to pray to God for willingness. God, give me some willingness because I ain't willing to do nothing. I ain't I still have to ask him to give me a willingness to do something different. You know, every day I'm trying to grow. And yeah. That's that's all I have on that. That's all you have on that? <laughs> yeah, but thank you for, for inviting me. And I hope I help somebody. You will. I, I get it all the time from people, you know, that reach out to me and say, I heard this episode and I heard that episode, and, you know, it relates to someone or something within the episode. So yeah, it definitely helps. Your story will get out there. Yeah. I and have a, I have a impact to change. It's a pink thing. It's impact to change on there. And um, you you're you can put your I'll, I will take your podcast. I have another friend that does the podcast, and I'm trying to get stories out to everybody. I mean, especially here. Uh, there's nobody here that does stories in West Virginia. We live in rural. Yeah, West and remind me to talk to you about stories afterwards because I have a bunch of written that I can show you. Okay. Yeah. Well, God, God bless you, and thank you so much. All right. Well, you just sit tight. I just want to say to everyone watching and listening, if you like what you heard, go below and give us a like. Also, subscribe. We're also on Reddit, uh, Reddit, Instagram, Twitter. We're also going to be posting this on Spotify, Anchor, YouTube. So if you need anything at all, you always can reach out to me. Uh, Minister Dev said you can reach out to her as well. Maybe we'll try and find her contact info or her handle at one of those social media sites. So that's all I have for today. Until next time.